Hey everybody, happy Thursday and welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast with me, your host, Harry Simi. Hope you're all good. Hope you're all well. I'm feeling a little bit under the weather today, hence the pre-recorded edition uh, of the podcast. I was planning to do this live this morning, but I'm not feeling great. So I figured at least this way, if I need to stop, I can stop and it won't be a problem. <laughs> Um, thank you all so, so much uh, for joining me. Really, really do appreciate it. Um, we're going to reflect on Arsenal's comfortable victory over Bayer Leverkusen at Emirates Stadium last night. Uh, the penultimate pre-season friendly for Mikel Arteta's side. One more to go, uh, that game against Olympic Lyonnais on Sunday before we kick off our Premier League campaign against Wolves the following weekend. And first of all, I just want to say it was great to be back at Emirates Stadium. Um, when I arrived some, what, two and a half hours before kickoff, um, I got proper sucked in. Like, I got there and I was like, mm, I got a bit of time. You know, I'm not on air until just before six o'clock. So why don't I go into the armory? And I got sucked into buying merch and I got sucked into basically um, just, yeah, doing the whole um, fan thing, um, which obviously I, I love. And, you know, it is... Uh, it is amazing, isn't it, to be there? It's it's, it's so great um, to kind of experience it in person, and I'm I know that I'm incredibly fortunate uh, to be able to go on a sort of weekly basis. But I just I sort of wanted to go for the full experience yesterday. You know, went there, went to the armory, um, just stood outside the ground for a little bit, taking it all in. I couldn't believe the crowds, by the way. You know, talking two and a half, three hours, even maybe before kickoff just the amount of people that were knocking about Emirates Stadium yesterday in anticipation of a pre-season friendly was just um, remarkable. Once I got into the ground, I went in, collected my pass, uh, went and sort of set up my radio kit and then um, sort of went out into the stadium, uh, into my position, and then just took a, took a walk down the steps uh, towards the pitch and and just literally stood pitch side for about 10, 15 minutes, taking it all in, thinking about what last season uh, was and and how it ended and, and the kind of feelings and emotions that we felt along the way and just hoping that the new campaign um, it, it is going to be better, preparing myself mentally, if you like, for the journey that we're about to go on, another campaign, another season. And there's lots and lots of reasons, once again, to be optimistic. And that's what's super exciting about being an Arsenal fan right now. As for our opponents yesterday by Leverkusen, this to me, and I don't know what you guys think, felt like the perfect friendly. There's no real rivalry between the two sides. So there's very little chance of things boiling over and turning into, um, you know, something on the kind of uh, theme of being nasty. Like there, there's very little chance of that happening against a side that you don't have any existing rivalry with. Um, but it's a side that obviously went unbeaten in the Bundesliga last season, the Invincibles. Uh, they, of course, uh, won the DFB Pokal as well. So they're a side that performed at an incredibly high level. But for losing the Europa League final, they would have literally done the treble um, or a treble but managed to do it unbeaten as well. So you've got to give Bayer Leverkusen immense credit for what they achieved last season. And I think, obviously, people would talk about Mikel Arteta's friendship with Xabi Alonso and, and the fact that that played a big part in maybe this friendly being arranged. But I think it was the perfect friendly in that. No direct rivalry, but a team that you think would give you a good and proper examination. And so given how easily we beat them and how comfortable we looked throughout, I think there's lots of reasons to be optimistic and to say that, OK, we're not quite there, but we're almost ready. We're almost ready for the new campaign. 
In terms of team news, David Raya was uh, was back in goal, of course. Saliba back in the defence. Rice and Saka weren't quite ready to start the game, but both of them being on the bench and coming on was obviously encouraging. First time we've seen them in preseason. But I guess the headlines uh, going into the game uh, when we talk about the team news were with regards to Yuri and Timber, who wasn't available. We talked about this previously. He was unavailable in our last game out in the US as well. Um, and what we understand is that uh, it's an injury that's been caused by them sort of starting to up his workload. Now, people will panic, people will be nervous, people will be concerned about this. Mikel Arteta said in his press conference after the game that he felt something in his foot. And I, I don't really think this is anything to worry about. I think it's perfectly natural that when you've been out for nine months, 10 months, that once you start to build yourself up again and play games regularly, and he played three friendlies, was it, in quick succession, you're going to be increasing the workload to a point that you haven't experienced in a while, and you're going to get twinges and you're going to get um, muscle aches and things like that. So I'm not particularly worried by this, I have to say. Um, yes, we want him back as soon as possible. Of course we do. And I thought he was probably going to start the season at left back. Maybe that's in doubt now. Uh, given the injury that he's experienced. But Mikel Arteta moved very, very quickly, I thought, in the press conference to make it clear that that wasn't anything to be particularly concerned about. The other one that I think people turned up hoping to see was Ricardo Calafiori. Hasn't worn the Arsenal shirt yet. Well, he has in photos, but he hasn't taken to the field in it just yet. And I think a lot of people making their way down to Emirates Stadium yesterday were hopeful that they were going to get a first glance at our Italian defender. Uh, but Mikel Arteta made the point again that, you know, he's been through a lot over the last couple of weeks. Um, he's had a lot going on and it feels like he just isn't quite up to speed and sort of listening to, to some of the people uh, within the club speaking about this yesterday ahead of the kickoff. Um, it's clear that there isn't a problem, there isn't an injury, there isn't a, a concern, uh, but that there is uh, a, a want to uh, be cautious with Ricardo Calafiori because of um, just how things have panned out for him over the last few weeks. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if he takes part on Sunday. I don't know for sure that he's going to be involved, but I wouldn't be surprised if he takes part. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully we can see him then. Uh, the goals yesterday scored by uh, Zinchenko, um, Trossard, and then there was uh, a goal from Gabriel Jesus. And then, of course, Kai Havertz uh, made it four with an instinctive finish before Adam Klojek pulled one back for Bayer Leverkusen. But there's a few moments in the game, a few points I want to touch on, highlight, and so it's time to bring out the slideshow. Yes, the first one of the 2024-25 season. Can you count this as the first one of the season when the season hasn't started yet? Probably not. But anyway, for those of you listening on audio, don't worry, I'm going to explain everything in great detail. But if you'd prefer to come over to YouTube so that you can see the visuals I'm going to use to demonstrate my points, then feel free to come over to the YouTube channel. That reminds me as well. If you're already watching on YouTube, why not leave us a like on the video? Why not subscribe to the channel as well? All of that brilliant stuff really does help. And if you're listening on uh, Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please, please do leave us a review. But anyway, uh, without further ado, let's get into uh, some of those key moments, some of the goals and uh, some of the takeaways from yesterday's victory over Bayer Leverkusen. Okay, so I want to start by focusing on the first goal, obviously scored by Alexander Zinchenko. Fantastic strike from him. Um, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because it came at a point where you know, we heard that he changed his squad number and that led to people sort of saying, well, perhaps he isn't set to leave given that. Why would you bother changing someone's squad number if, you know, you you feel like they're close to an exit? And we talked about that the other day. Um, we released a video on the channel, not yesterday, the day before, that was a clip from a recent episode. I think it was the episode after the Liverpool defeat over in Philadelphia. And I talked about the fact that, yes, OK, there are defensive deficiencies when it comes to Alexander Zinchenko. Nobody is doubting that, but he still has quite a bit to offer. And I thought yesterday he went out there and showed everybody what it is that he can give you on a good day and what it is that he brings in possession. Now, out of possession, there are still questions. We know that defensively, there are still questions. But there are games, I think, where Alexander Zinchenko can still be a very, very useful player for us. 
And I want to talk about the left-sided combinations that we saw yesterday. Something that I would argue Arsenal were lacking um, last season. So is this something that they've been working on? And Alexander Zinchenko played, of course, a big part in that. If we look at the first goal and the, the build-up to the first goal, you'll see it here. Zinchenko's in possession on that left-hand side. And this all comes about because Kai Havertz, once again, playing in that midfield, and we'll come on to talk about that a little bit later on, um, is willing to run into spaces and willing to run into channels. But it's no good making runs into spaces and making runs into channels if there isn't anybody capable of picking you out, if there isn't anybody whose mind is going to click as soon as they see you make that move and then has the technical ability to execute that pass. And this all comes from Zinchenko dropping a nice ball into that left channel that Kai Havertz drifts out of his left eight position uh, from and, and goes into that wide area to kind of chase this down. But there are a couple of unsung heroes here in the way that Arsenal were able to pull Bayer Leverkusen apart. I thought in the first half, we did a really, really good job of causing them problems in the wide areas. They had obviously set up with a back three, which meant that their centre-halves were having to go out wider than maybe they'd have liked because of some of our movement. Kai Havertz uh, showing a great example of that. So Zinchenko drops this ball over the top. There's a couple of unsung heroes here. So Gabriel Jesus, who's out of your shot in this uh, picture that I'm showing, he has stayed high. And the fact that he stays high makes it difficult for uh, Bayer Leverkusen's defenders to step out and go to confront Kai Havertz early enough. If, if there's nobody sort of on the shoulder, if there's nobody standing up high, then they can go and they can close this space down nice and early. The minute they get a whiff of trouble. But because Jesus stays high, that reduces Leverkusen's ability to get people out to that position nice and quickly. And the other player who's highlighted on your screen there, just in the middle of the uh, three highlighted players, is Leandro Trossard. Because him coming short to Alexander Zinchenko and dragging Frimpong with him is essentially uh, what allows Zinchenko to identify and then execute the pass into that space. So it just goes to show the importance and, and the impact that you can have without always touching the ball. Just purely coming short and bringing someone with you has opened the corridor for someone else like Kai Havertz, who's always on the front foot in terms of trying to make runs, to get in behind you. So that's a, a really, really good move. And Arsenal open up by Leverkusen there brilliantly. The next phase of this is when uh, Kai Havertz gets towards the byline and he cuts this back. And there's a a couple of dummies along the way. And in the end, it finds Zinchenko on the edge of the box, who strikes brilliantly, by the way. Uh, it's very easy in that situation when you're coming onto the ball from that angle with your left foot to drag it wide. But he executes the shot to perfection. But I've called this slide invading the box. And this is something that Arsenal have done incredibly well in the last couple of seasons under Mikel Arteta. The way they're able to get so many bodies into the penalty area so early flooding the penalty area, invading the penalty area. That gives you, A, of course, a greater chance of getting one of your players on the end of the ball because the more of you there, uh, the more chance it has uh, of falling your way. But also by getting into the box, you're also dragging everyone with you. Nobody wants to be the guy that let the runner make his way into the box um, unchallenged and, and find the back of the net. So people naturally get sucked in and that can create space for that second wave of runners, which in this case was Alexander Zinchenko. And he gets there and he makes um, the most of the opportunity. And it's a really, really good finish from him. But it, it just, for me, you know, there's a couple of things that this particular move and, and goal highlight. So first, uh, Zinchenko's eye for a pass, which we talked about quite a bit. Uh, Kai Havertz, his ability to spot spaces and make his way into them nice and quickly. He gets ahead of them. Uh, he gets there ahead of most because he's deceivingly quick across the ground, Kai Havertz. He takes those big old strides. Um, I've mentioned the role of Trossard and Jesus. Uh, Jesus staying high uh, and preventing uh, the centre-backs from stepping out. Trossard coming short, bringing the defender with him, opening the door uh, for Havertz, really. And, and as I said, right at the top of this little segment, combination play down the left was lacking it last season. And I think that came um, about largely because we constantly changed personnel there. We played with different left eights. We played with different left backs. Uh, sometimes it was Martinelli. Sometimes it was Trossard. And in the end, I think we just lacked that bit of cohesion. Um, 
But, you know, we've also displayed once again our ability to get plenty of bodies in the box, occupy defenders and create spaces uh, for others uh, making the run. But, you know, Arsenal nowadays are a very well-oiled machine. Um, that's how I describe them. Everybody understands the system. Everybody understands their role. And nobody is idle at any point in this Arsenal team. People are always having an influence inside. One way, shape or form. And that's kind of because if you can utilize every single one of your players, if you can have them all active at any given time, then at some point in the circuit, you are going to find a defender who was switched off. You are going to find a fault in the defensive circuit, in the defensive unit. And that's going to allow you the moment and the space and the opportunity that perhaps you need to um you know to, to to punish them and and that's what we're finding and look again fire leverkusen to be clear were nowhere near their best yesterday and i know they had players missing so did we um but this is a good side that we're doing this too so there's reasons to be optimistic the other thing i wanted to really highlight was um the value of arsenal's press again it's something that we've been talking about for the last couple of seasons but what we saw last night for the first time in pre-season was us do it with a real intensity for more than just a few minutes. It feels like the fitness levels are building. It feels like we're getting closer. It feels like, as I said earlier, we're almost ready for the new season. Um, the significance of our press is huge. The way that we can rob people of the ball really high up and then have the people in place to punish them um, is, is something that served us so, so well in recent seasons. And there were some great examples of that again last night as well. Uh, if you look at the uh, second goal, which came about uh, because we forced an error out of the Bayer Leverkusen backline, you can see I've highlighted it first wave and second wave. The first wave is three players, one going to close down the goalkeeper, the other two going to close down the two obvious passing options for him. Now, they can't close down every passing option. What they're trying to do is force him either uh, to go wide um, and and that gives Arsenal time to kind of shift back into position and uh, and defend uh, against any potential transition really, really effectively. Uh, but also they're saying to the goalkeeper, well, you dare play it down the middle and we will pinch it from you. And that's exactly what happens. But the, the winning of the ball comes with the second wave. And I always talk about this with pressing. Your second wave of your press is really important. And sometimes you're going to need a third wave as well. Pressing with one unit, pressing with one wave is not enough. And if you press with one wave, often what happens is that first wave gets bypassed and then all of a sudden you've got three, four players, depending on how many went aggressively uh, to chase the ball. And, um, you know, they're out of the game and the team have played through you. So you need the next wave to back it up. And only if the waves are coming constantly and regularly and with the right intervals between them, are you going to win the ball back? And that's exactly what Arsenal do here. So, um, A, we talk about the intensity, the fact that that looked like it was back yesterday, and that's great. But B, we talk about the need to do it in waves and for the intervals between the waves to be perfect. And then uh, you see composure here because there was a few passes, a few really tidy passes uh, inside the penalty area before the ball ended up finding Leandro Trossard, who gets it, what, just... Uh, slightly closer to goal than the penalty spot. He can't be more than eight yards out there, uh, Leandro Trossard. But it's just a little bit awkward for him. The way it comes to him, it's just a little bit awkward. Can't quite set his body. And so what does he do? He keeps his composure. He produces a wonderful little bit of skill to shake off the final defender in his way. And then he makes it a certain goal rather than a chance. And that's what I really, really liked about that finish uh, from Leandro Trossard. So loads and loads of positives again uh, for Arsenal. And that was a, a wonderful goal. That was my favourite goal of the night in terms of the way we, A, went and won the ball back and then were really kind of precise in the way that we used that possession to carve another opportunity. And we created such a strong situation that even when it looked like a great chance we wanted to make sure that it was a certain goal now sometimes Arsenal are accused of overplaying and maybe had Leandro Trossard not pulled off that bit of skill then we'd have been talking about it through that kind of prism but I mean the finish was excellent the composure showed and the the sort of the fact that we're not just winning the ball back but once we're winning the ball back 
We know straight away, bam, bam, bam. This is what we need to do. This is how we're going to get to goal. You know, it's it's something that you can see is is getting better and better year on year with this Arsenal team as those relationships between our players um, really do develop. So those were my thoughts on the first two goals. The third goal uh, was a, a brilliant um, goal from Gabriel Jesus. Picks the ball up on the left. He's allowed to drift in field uh, really, really easily. I would say that the goalkeeper probably should have done better there. I, I watched the replay back a few times and I felt like he could have got down sooner. Um, and, and if he does, then he, he maybe makes the save there. I don't think it's the greatest strike from Gabriel Jesus, but he's a player who had a rough time of it last season and is often criticised for not scoring enough goals. So any goal for him um, is a confidence boost and, and something that we can all um, enjoy. With the fourth one, uh, defensive mistake, the ball fell to uh, Kai Havertz after some good work from Bukayo Saka down the right-hand side, but there wasn't anything particularly uh, exciting in that one for me to kind of really want to deep dive into that. We're going to take a short pause. When we come back, we're going to talk about a couple of other subjects. We're going to talk Fabio Vieira. Did he take his chance last night? We're going to talk Luis Skelly and Nwaneri. We'll talk Havertz in midfield because Arteta just doesn't seem to be done with that. And I asked Mikel Arteta uh, about the Havertz and Jesus combination. And we'll have a bit of a discussion as to whether or not those two can play together. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna. Don't go anywhere. Fabio Vieira started the game last night and I saw some suggestions on uh, X pre-kickoff that perhaps Arsenal um, look at Fabio Vieira and see him as the deputy on that right-hand side. And, you know, they invested a fair bit of money on him and, and you know, maybe they want to give him another chance and see how he gets on. I don't believe for a second that Mikel Arteta is done with him, but I'm struggling to see where Fabio Vieira fits in. I, I see a good player there. I see a technical player there. And we've seen flashes of what he's capable of. And you can understand why Arsenal wanted to bring him in, but he's got to deliver consistently. And for a player that very much is on the fringes, when you get an opportunity like yesterday, albeit in a preseason friendly, you've got to grab it with both hands. And I just never felt at any point that Fabio Vieira did that last night. So um, that isn't going to do him any favours. Um, I'm sure Mikel Arteta wasn't totally pleased with what he produced yesterday, but it also isn't going to do him any favours with the fans as well, who I think have just watched Emil Smith-Rowe leave and think to themselves, well, is Fabio Vieira better? Is Fabio Vieira a player that gives us more than Emil Smith-Rowe? And, and right now, based on the evidence we're seeing, there isn't a great deal in it. I would argue that there was a market to sell Emil Smith-Rowe, and there probably isn't for Fabio Vieira, which is what, um, well, I'm not going to say it's what made the decision for Arsenal, but it was certainly a contributing factor, I would argue, in why they opted to move him on rather than the, the Portuguese uh, midfield player. But yeah, um, just didn't take the chance for me. And, you know, he's going to need to take chances when he gets them, because if he doesn't, I, I just don't see how he ever establishes himself in this Arsenal side. But hey, um, you know, hopefully, he, if he gets the chance against Leon at the weekend, he performs to a much higher level. Wanted to talk Lewis Skelly and Waneri. Uh, both of them came on again yesterday and both of them just look so comfortable, don't they, in that first team environment. Mikel Arteta said in his press conference, if they carry on the way they are, they'll get chances. Doesn't matter whether we sign them from Argentina, Italy, Germany, or if they come from the academy, everybody's treated the same. And if they're good enough, they will play. Um, Lewis Skelly, for me, um, is the one that I'm a bit surprised by. I knew that Ethan Waneri was a huge talent. Lewis Skelly has been sort of brought up playing as a midfield player, but is being used as a left-back right now. And we know that Arsenal left-backs do need to be able to move into midfield. And Lewis Skelly got the opportunity, I think, to show off some of his midfield capabilities yesterday. Interestingly, straight after the full-time whistle, Mikel Arteta was straight over to him. And those two were having a word about something. And it was asked... Um, of Mikel Arteta in the press conference, what did you say to him? And he said, I went to speak to him about some of the actions that he did really, really well, but also some of the things that he needs to grasp a, a kind of greater understanding of. Um, so look, it, you know, for a manager that's accused of not caring about young players, he's playing young players and he's taking the time and um, wanting to go and deliver messages to them that he believes are going to help them improve. So those two look really, really comfortable. Uh, Lewis Skelly looked good. One area as well, he just 
you know, there's some players that you look at and you can just see that they've got it. The way he carries the ball, the way he glides across the pitch, the balance that he has. Um, you know, he's just fantastic to watch. And I'm really excited about what the new season holds for him. Kai Havertz started the game in midfield and there were, of course, uh, questions about that. A lot of Arsenal fans felt that that experiment in the first half of last season didn't really work, myself included. But I just wonder if there's a world in which him and Gabriel Jesus could form a really, really fruitful pairing and partnership. Um, Jesus, you know, didn't play as much football as he would have liked last season. Um, I think that the reason they bring the best out in each other is because Jesus likes to go roaming. Jesus likes to drop deep, likes to go left, likes to go right. And Kai Havertz, when he plays in midfield, quite enjoys looking forward, identifying spaces, getting his head down and basically running into them, waiting to be found. And I think if you've got the right structure behind our midfield, so if you've got the right number six, if you've got the right inverted fullback that is going to come in and be almost the second number six when we're attacking, then maybe you can get away with this. It's a bit like the Zinchenko thing in that I think there are games where you shouldn't do it. I think there are games where against the better opposition, that slight imbalance that that gives us will cause a problem and we might be punished for it. But I think there will be plenty of games over the course of the season where you can get away with it because Kai Havertz is more than capable of dropping deep into midfield, making challenges, doing all the defensive stuff as well. And I think that's the bit that he never really gets credit for. And I find it difficult to kind of comprehend why. I asked Mikel Arteta yesterday um, about this because I watched the game and I just thought that the combination play between two players that have not really played an awful lot of football together was just on a really, really high level. There seems to be a chemistry and understanding between the two. And I think that for Jesus, who's often criticised for not staying at centre forward, to have someone that's going to go into those spaces when he vacates them sort of means that we're not looking at him when there's no one in those areas. But also for Havertz, who is more of a forward than a midfielder, having that uh, sort of opportunity frequently to drift into those areas where he can do more damage probably suits him quite well as well. So it feels like this is a really good combo and a really good pair and two players that if they can build that understanding further could really bring the best out of each other. And I asked Mikel Arteta about that after the game. Uh, let's have a quick uh, listen uh, to what he had to say on that. Yes, uh, I think it's something that you can see coming. It's natural, it flows. There's good chemistry between them, as well with Leo. I think because the three, they have that nine, false nine profile. Uh, and I really like what I saw today. Yeah. So there we have it. Mikel Arteta, not just talking about the two that I asked him about, but throwing in uh, the name of Leandro Trossard as well, who he sees as a player capable of playing in that force nine profile as well. So as the point I'm trying to make is as long as you've got the defensive structure behind them, then having that fluidity and the ability to interchange positions the way that those three can and the understanding that they're kind of developing and forming, it makes us really, really difficult to defend against and really, really difficult to pick up. Hearing that yesterday, I, I'm not, I'm still not convinced that Mikel's going to go with that week in, week out. But it does make me think that maybe in his estimations, that's where Martinelli falls down a little bit. I think Martinelli gives you the directness, the raw pace, all of that stuff, the drive. But is he on the same wavelength as these guys when it comes to sort of interchanging positions, getting into the right spaces, being really intelligent with your movement. He probably isn't. And I think that's maybe why, partly why, he's found himself uh, having to kind of uh, prove himself all over again, at least in terms of warranting a starting position. But I thought that was a really, really interesting uh, bit from yesterday's game. And obviously really grateful to be able to ask Mikel Arteta the question and get a, a really good response as well. Um yeah, let me know uh, your thoughts on that as well. Um, I'd be really, really interested uh, to hear them. Uh, just to finish off, I'm going to take a couple of comments from X. Uh, I did put a post up yesterday saying full time at the Emirates and we're pre-recording in the morning. Um, 
So uh, what did you guys have to say? Um, Belgian Guna asked me uh, whether or not I think Fabio Vieira's future um, is on that right-hand side rather than being the backup for Martin Erdegaard. And I think, look, I'm not convinced that that's his best position and I'm not convinced that that's what we should be doing with Fabio Vieira. But I certainly think based on where we've seen him start games and where we've seen him get opportunities, that's where Mikel Arteta believes um, that he's best suited to playing right now. I don't think Arteta trusts him in the middle. We've talked about it lots of times before. Physicality seems to be a big thing for Arteta when building his team. And, and so, you know, I think he's probably willing to compromise on that a little bit in the wide areas, but certainly wouldn't be willing to do that in a central area. And I think that's what's working against Fabio Vieira at this moment in time. Is he good enough to to be that guy that we turn to when maybe Bukayo Saka is not available or needs a rest? I think that remains to be seen. But I do think that in Arteta's eyes, he is more of a right-sided player for us than a central player. Yes, for sure. Um, Stefan says, I really enjoyed the match. I did too. You know, preseason friendlies are often dull and drab and boring. And there were moments in that game where the level dropped off significantly. But generally, it was a pretty... Um, pretty good uh pretty good uh performance bandwagon luca says hello harry do you think that kai havertz's performance in midfield is going to make us ditch our ambition of signing Mikel marino again yesterday in and around the club there were no suggestions that the Mikel marino deal is close and that's interesting because people are still reporting that actually this is moving forward now let me be clear i don't know i'm just going by what i hear um and i don't hear of anything being imminent, but equally there are people that have much more in the know than me saying that it is close. So the truth is, guys, I just don't know uh, about this. But what I will say is, is a line that I used earlier. I don't think the Havertz in midfield thing is done in Arteta's mind anyway. And I think that he probably feels like with the right structure, as I keep saying, that it can work. I think that if he can build those pairings and combinations between Havertz and some of the forwards and have him almost as a fourth forward, uh, in a lot of games, I think he will do that. So, yeah, it's really, really interesting. Um, I, I don't think it changes Arsenal's plans. I still think Arsenal want a midfielder because they need to have an alternate option as well. Um, and I still think Arsenal want a forward. I think in an ideal world, Arsenal bring in two more players between now and the end of the window. But they've got to be the right players and you've got to be able to do the deals. And at this moment in time, we don't know of anything uh, being close. Uh, Daniel C87, full of praise for Miles Lewis Skelly. He says, looking as if he's going to be one hell of a player. Absolutely. Um, and Mustafa says, Nwaneri looks like he's going to be at Odegaard cover. Strong in possession and trusted with the ball. I don't know that I'd go as far as saying he's the Odegaard cover. Like if Odegaard got injured tomorrow, touch wood, that doesn't happen. I don't think that Nwaneri would be turned to instantly, but I think that's the view. I think that's the the long-term goal for him. I think that's what Arsenal are trying to build him up to being, but I don't think... He's quite there just yet. Guys, thank you, uh, as always, for tuning in uh, to the podcast. Really, really appreciate your love and support. Sorry for the slightly delayed episode. Sorry uh, it wasn't live today. Uh, but please do leave a like on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. It really, really does help. And I'll catch you all on the next one. Until then, take care of yourselves and have a great day. Goodbye.